Today, we are talking about the Jets, arguably the most polarizing team in the NFL going into the 2024 season. We're going to do a full seven-round mock draft. We're going to go through the current roster. We're going to talk about what the Jets might need and, more importantly, what they really don't need. This is a very complete-looking roster right now. There's not a whole ton of gaps, and this team can compete this season. And the thing is, the Jets have to compete this season. They are in a window now that might only last for one or two seasons to try and win a Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers. And I'm here to see it. I think it'll be a fascinating story. It's great for the AFC. The AFC East is a movie right now with the Dolphins and the Bills and the Jets. We don't need to worry about the Patriots for a while, but they had their fair share. Now, for the Jets, a seven-round mock draft, and this draft is crucial to getting them to where they need to be. So if you enjoy your mock draft content, if you enjoy your draft content in general, please do subscribe to the channel. My name is Alex. I do NFL draft mocks for most teams in the NFL. I think we've covered near enough all the teams right now. Uh, But if you enjoy that kind of content, stick around. Please do subscribe. We'll be doing a lot more of this stuff in the run-up to the draft. And then we'll also be covering some analysis. That word didn't come out. Some analysis towards the end of April and into May once the NFL draft is over, analyzing all of those things. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the Jets today. We are going to get right into the acquisitions they made in free agency, the guys they lost, the guys that they've brought in. We're going to go over the roster and then we will get into the mock draft. Okay, so one of the main things that sticks out to me here is the loss of depth in the secondary. And I do believe that that is something that the Jets will address in the draft. I don't necessarily believe that they will do so early, um, but there is just depth that kind of went missing. Now, Jordan Whitehead to me was one of the bigger losses, um, mainly for the position more than like the incredible skill set, but he's going back to Tampa Bay and that leaves the Jets with a gap at safety. So they have a significant lack of depth at safety right now, which is definitely something that when you go through the roster, and we'll do that here in just a moment, that's definitely one of the things that I feel like sticks out in terms of things that the Jets are missing right now um, going into the 2024 season. Um, The other thing they kind of moved around on the offensive line in terms of Lakin Tomlinson is gone, Dwayne Brown is gone, uh, Makai Becton is yet to sign with another team, which I think is fascinating. The fact that this guy came out of college, had all this potential, was one of these like really highly regarded young offensive tackles with the size, the length, everything, and it just did not go to plan. A lot of injuries, uh, and he is now just on the market, just kind of floating about. Is there a chance the Jets bring him back? Maybe like on a on a very minimal deal if that's all he can get. But right now it looks like obviously the interest is not kind of mounting up for him. Guys like Ashton Davis maybe will come back as depth in the secondary. Um, but that kind of looking at it is there isn't a whole bunch that I would do here. I mean, uh, CJ Uzama was released. Dwayne Brown's getting a lot older. Lakin Tomlinson was really disappointing, was meant to be um, this high profile addition to the offensive line. Didn't work out. Uh, Kyle Lawson had the season ending injury. Hasn't been the same since. Um, so again, disappointing to lose those guys, but you've upgraded off on the offensive line. So John Simpson uh, comes in as a guy who is really highly regarded, actually, uh, with a chance to prove himself on a two-year deal and get a further extension. And he's still just 26 years old. Not all that common to find starting caliber guards on the open market at 26 years old. So John Simpson, I like. He will slot right in, probably at left guard, um, as a starter. And I think that's a really good move for the Jets to have made. And suddenly, after free agency, this offensive line looks a lot more complete than it did like a month ago. So we can go through all of that. But obviously, the major additions, the biggest additions that the uh, Jets have made were... John Simpson, Mike Williams is another one. And obviously acquiring Hassan Reddick in the trade, also very important. And then you've got Javon Kinlaw came over one year deal, former first round pick. Um, So we're adding some real talent here. And obviously that is also a guy that Robert Sala knows very well. And I would imagine had a strong hand in drafting him in San Francisco. So cool to see those guys reunited. Uh, Obviously Bryce Huff leaves, but Hassan Reddick comes in. Um, So a lot of kind of in and out, a lot of chopping and changing guys. Solomon Thomas, you held on to on $3 million. I don't think that's a bad deal either. Um, But it is the secondary that concerns me the most. So like if we look at the roster, obviously offense, I would say I wouldn't be surprised if you guys add another running back because I think Brees Hall is going to be kind of one of the most relied on bell cow running backs in the NFL. Is he a Banakanda mid-round pick in last year's draft? What can he do in the NFL? We don't know just yet. 
Um, quarterback, like Tyrod Taylor is going to be the backup. Zach Wilson still on the roster right now, kind of stuck on the roster more than anything. Um, and then at wide receiver, Garrett Wilson, Mike Williams, you do have a little bit of an issue with a slot wide receiver. The question is whether Xavier Gibson, who is primarily a special teamer, can step up and be a slot wide receiver. And I don't know particularly because you don't necessarily have a starting caliber tight end. And that's something that we'll come to in the draft. But I don't know that you want to go into the season expecting that Xavier Gibson can do that. Like, I would imagine that you probably want to try and add a guy. And maybe Garrett Wilson plays more of that role or splits it between lining up on the outside and more of the slot role. Um, It really depends, but you kind of need a third option. And I don't know that Tyler Conklin is going to be the third option. I would say maybe looking at a slot wide receiver is is something you could do. But again, I don't know how much of a priority that will be for the Jets. Then, of course, the offensive line. So Tyron Smith, somebody I didn't mention yet, comes in at left tackle. So you get like future Hall of Fame level experience covering Aaron Rodgers' blind side. The problem there is his, his, his health and whether he can actually stay healthy going into the season. So... Definitely something to keep in mind there. I don't know that I would take the Jets off the board for drafting offensive tackle. You've got Morgan Moses coming back on the right side. Max Mitchell is over there as well. Would you draft another guy that could maybe play either tackle position, like an Armarius Mims or somebody like that? I wouldn't rule it out. Um, Definitely something to keep in mind. And also whether the Jets stick at pick 10 and take offensive line, or maybe they trade back, look at different things. We'll get into all of that when we get to the draft. But... All of that is definitely worth talking about. Now, defensively, so really like what they did with the offensive line. This looks like a complete offensive line if it can stay healthy. Then you've got a couple of depth pieces that you've added like Max Mitchell and uh, I don't know much about Jake Hansen, but another addition uh, in terms of depth, but I would still consider it in the draft. Then on defense, you've got John Franklin Myers, Javon Kitt, Kinlaw, Quinn and Williams and Hassan Reddick as your defensive front with guys like Jermaine Johnson, Solomon Thomas, uh, Lecky Fotu in the depths there. And of course, like Will McDonald, who the jury is still out on. Like this is a first round pick kind of sitting around in depth right now. Um, but then the trade for Hassan Reddick means that maybe we're not expecting Will McDonald will be able to play that role right away. Um, so he's definitely one that we will need to keep an eye on. Uh, linebacker, don't love the depth at linebacker. Um, probably would look to add at least one more guy here who can come in in rotation, maybe play some special teams, maybe look to play a key role depending on how early you draft one. Um, and then the secondary. So this is kind of my issue with the secondary. You've got Source Gardner and DJ Reed. Depth, that's pretty much it. Like Brandon Eccles, Isaiah Oliver, you know, I would say you probably want at least one more guy that if somebody goes down, you would trust them as a starter because otherwise your secondary kind of falls apart. This puts a lot of pressure on Source Gardner and DJ Reed and also the longevity and the future of that secondary. You still kind of need to keep that in mind. I know that the Jets are going to be all out to win it this year or this and this or next year, but you still need to keep the longevity of your roster in mind before you find yourself in a colossal rebuild. And there will be a fire sale when Aaron Rodgers retires, um, you know, of some of these veteran guys like your Hassan Reddicks and guys that are coming over on shorter contracts towards the end of the of their kind of peak of their careers. Um, and, and safety at the moment is a problem. Like Chuck Clark and Tony Adams, that's it. That's all you've got. Tony Adams, I think, can be a starting caliber safety in the NFL. But you need some depth. You need a guy who could step into a starting role. You need a guy who can rotate. You don't want to have just have, you can't have those two guys on the field at all times. So I think adding some depth in the secondary is going to be really important. That still doesn't give me any indication what the Jets are going to do with their first round pick. And I kind of think that that's just how Joe Douglas likes it. Okay, so the draft. Now, very interesting position for the Jets to be in. Now, the first thing that I would like to highlight here is the lack of a second round pick. Like you've got pick number 10. All right, great, which is fantastic. But round two, nothing. Not until you get to the 72nd pick in the third round. That alone gives me enough reason to believe that this Jets team would be looking to trade back from this 10 spot. And I wouldn't be even slightly surprised to see them do that. Couple of things that I would have thought about. Now, I know that Brock Bowers is one of the most interesting conversations that you're going to be able to have right now. Uh, I'm going to start the draft so we can kind of see who comes off the board. So Marvin Harrison dropped a pick number nine. Wow. Okay, I think if that's the case, honestly, I think if Marvin Harrison drops, and, and you guys, Jets fans, let me know in the comments what you would do about this. But in this situation, and I I don't see Roma Dunes being the first wide receiver off the board. I just don't see it happening. The first three could easily go this way. 
we could easily see it being Caleb Williams, JJ McCarthy, Drake May. Is that a mistake with Jaden Daniels? Maybe, but I do have my concerns about Jaden Daniels' longevity in the NFL as well. You know, he's a definitely a running quarterback, a guy who needs to kind of run to, to engage his game to the best of his ability. But with his size and frame, I don't know how that pans out. I mean, this guy compared to Anthony Richardson, who already got injured in the NFL, and Robert Griffin III as well, he's a lot more wiry, smaller frame, don't love it. But, the, I mean, the last time the Giants picked a quarterback at six, it worked out really well, didn't it? So, uh, all right, we don't know what they're going to do there. But, but I think by the time you get to, like, the Tennessee Titans at pick seven here, Joe Douglas should be, like, on the phone to the Atlanta Falcons being like, hey, can we jump up two spots? And that goes against everything that I just said, but this is Marvin Harrison, who's like slipping down the draft board. And I don't know that that makes any sense. But anyway, let's talk about the 10 pick and some of the guys that are definitely options for the Jets in the very first round. So get yourselves comfortable. We're going to go through this draft. What we'll do is do the first four rounds. Then we'll wrap up the back end of the draft and we'll do a summary at the end as we do in all of our other videos. So if you enjoy this stuff, please do hit that subscribe button. Hang around. It'd be nice to have some more Jets fans knocking around the place, talking about this upcoming season and stuff with me. So would appreciate you guys being here. Now, for the Jets at pick number 10, a uh, couple of guys that I would look at. Uh, Talis Fuanga is one of them. Oregon State, versatile offensive lineman. Can play multiple alignments. I would say that he could play guard in his first couple of years. Can definitely play on the outside as well. But that versatility and the aggression um, that he would have, both in the run game and as a protector for Aaron Rodgers, he could be a day one starter on your offensive line. And I don't disagree or dislike that whatsoever. The fact that even if he doesn't start, that he's got the competitive edge and the fire to be able to do that and become a long-term piece for this franchise going forwards um that is really important to me I think that would be really good for the Jets roster I think fitting him in there on the offensive line you've got a lot of question marks on that right side still with Morgan Moses and uh, Elijah Vera Tucker as well um just in terms of longevity and their health and all that sort of stuff so um Fuanga would be a great option and would give you great security if you needed it that all right if Tyron Smith goes down you could probably put him over there um, if Morgan Moses goes down, you can put him there. If Elijah Vera Tucker comes out, you can play him at guard. And it's not the sexy pick, all right, to pick depth at offensive line in the first round. It's not going to be the sexy pick because they're not necessarily going to be a high-impact player right out of the gate. You're not going to see him making highlight plays left and right. It's more shoring up the offensive line, even with the work you've done in the offseason, to add additional depth to that to be able to support Aaron Rodgers. The other is, of course, Brock Bowers. Now, the, the New York Jets don't have a primary tight end who is going to go out and get you seven, 800 yards and seven or eight touchdowns a season. You guys don't have that, all right? I quite like Tyler Conklin. I think he's quite often a sleeper if you're looking to get in like a ringer for your fantasy football team at tight end. I don't mind Tyler Conklin at all, but... Is he a high-impact player that can be the third option in your offense at the position? I would argue no. Now, I like Mike Williams too, but to me, in his current position with his career, Mike Williams is a third option. Like, your first option is going to be Garrett Wilson, right? To me, you then need a second option who could be a high-volume slot-wide receiver or powerful tight end who can dominate and mismatch against safeties, linebackers, whoever you try and cover him with. That would be my second option. Mike Williams is your jump ball specialist third option who kind of reminds me of like his, his career at this point is kind of similar to like Devontae Parker's as a jump ball specialist who you can throw down the sideline to. And I think Mike Williams is a far better player than Devontae Parker, but he's kind of been reduced to that role. And again, health is an issue. So like wide receiver slash tight end and a primary pass catcher, I wouldn't rule it out. I really wouldn't. And like, if Aaron Rodgers is going to be out there saying like, this is what I need. Like I need you guys to get me like a, a diverse tight end or somebody like that. Brock Bowers is definitely on the board. The thing is here that you could probably get away with trading back and still getting one of those two guys. So Fawanga is definitely one that I would look at. You're in a position here where some of the corners on the board are going to be really, really good quality talent. Quinion Mitchell is one of those. Cooper DeJean, who you could probably play at safety if you needed to. So again, some versatility there. And Terry on Arnold, in my mind, is the best man coverage corner in this year's draft. So 
he might suit to have in behind Source Gardner and DJ Reed, and he might claim a starting role from Reed a little bit later in the season and be the long term starter opposite Source for multiple seasons going forward. Um, do you want to add pieces on the on the edges? I would say no. And if you are looking to trade back, there are still so many pieces in the mid of the first round. Like you don't need to pick at pick ten here. You don't need a guy like Quinion Mitchell. You don't need Jerzan Newton, who I don't think is going to go above Byron Murphy anyway. Um, you don't necessarily need those corners. You don't need the edge rush like Jared Verse or Latu Latu. Um, so you could trade back ten spots here comfortably to pick twenty and still get somebody who would be just as powerful for your offense. Jackson Powers Johnson is one of those guys. Nate Wiggins is another if you were looking for the secondary. Amarius Mims is a guy I mentioned that could play either tackle spot. Huge frame. He's a winner. Comes from the University of Georgia. There's a lot to like there about him too. Um, and then we're getting into guys that are probably not like like on the verge of being first round picks, but not necessarily guaranteed in that category, like Peyton Wilson, Tyler Newbin, Tyler Guyton, Adonai Mitchell, those sorts of guys. So, I would trade back and I would trade back at least once because the Jets could trade back here. Let's say Michael Penix is obviously still on the board. Um, let's say that the Las Vegas Raiders want to jump both the Vikings and the Broncos, which is very, very feasible to come up and get the quarterback that they want, which at the moment looks like it will probably be Michael Penix. Had a really good pro day, really showed out, showed the athleticism. There was a lot to like there and boosted his draft stock in doing so. Scouts are raising the profile on Michael Penix Jr. So he's raising, rising up boards. So the Raiders could come up here and you guys could drop to pick 13. And while we talk about this, this uh, what better way than to actually execute something along those lines? So you give up the 10, um, the Raiders come up from pick 13, and I would say that you want to get pick 44 from them and let's say around five pick next year and you give them around six. You know, it's it's not... Is tilted in your favor, let's say that much. I don't think the Raiders would give up their second rounder to come up three spots to pick 10, but what's the future of their franchise to be able to draft him over both the Vikings uh, and the Denver Broncos? So we're going to force this trade through. We're going to resume the draft and we're going to be on the board again at pick number 13. Now, Tali Fawanga, obviously like, I did that with the intention that they would take Michael Penix. I have no control over them actually doing that. It would make no sense for them not to, but here we are. Let's just assume for the sake of the video that that is what they did. Then you get Jared Verse at 11, Quinion Mitchell at 12, and then the New York Jets are back on the board here at pick number 13. So this is what I'm talking about in terms of potentially trading back multiple times. All right, so pick 13. Now, I know for a fact that there will be Jets fans out there right now that are screaming Brock Bauer's name at me, right? We've already traded back. We acquired a second round pick, which is phenomenal news. Obviously, probably slightly tilted it in our favor with the Raiders there in doing so. But at the same time, for the sake of the video, it shows the necessity in doing so to be able to add that value with multiple guys who can be early impact players for the Jets rather than only having one pick in the top 70. I think that to me is crucial. I'd actually be really surprised if the Jets stuck there at 10 and just drafted somebody. I really don't think they're going to do that. I think Joe Douglas is smarter than that. And I do think that the trade back will happen. Now, some of the guys we talked about are still here on the board. Brock Bowers is one of them. Cooper DeGene is another. Troy Fatanu is another guy that I would potentially recommend that you guys look at here. And then you've got uh, Olu Fashionu here as well, who's kind of fallen a little bit, was kind of earlier in this year, he was kind of mocked in the top 10. Dropped off ever so slightly, and he's now closer to JC Latham and Amarius Mims a little further down the board. But... At pick number 13, would I recommend sitting here and drafting? Like if you were going to take a wide receiver, you're way too early for somebody like Brian Thomas or Adonai Mitchell. Um, but you're also going to miss both of those guys at pick number 44. So again, something to consider there. So I would argue, and again, I don't know how feasible this is, but one thing that I would consider, the Cincinnati Bengals lost Jonah Williams to free agency. He is currently out on the market. Um, and that means that the Bengals are in dire need of offensive linemen. And that should be their priority this year because they need to keep Joe Burrow healthy. They've got all the pieces that in, in other positions, like their wide receivers, one of the best in the league, and they need offensive line. So what we're going to do here is trade back a second time. And I don't know that this will necessarily be the case, but that's what we're going to look to do. Um, and this time we're going to acquire the 80 pick and we're going to give up... Mm, well, I know we're kind of playing Madden right now, but um, we're going to give up the 80... We're going to give up a fifth rounder next year. 
um, and take the 18 and the 80 for a, for the 13 and a fifth round pick. All right, so they come up, and this is because the Bengals will want to take um, whatever tackle that they want to take at pick number 13. So it ends up being Olu Fashionu, right? Now we're on the board at pick number 18. Now that we did miss out on Brock Bowers, and that is one thing to keep in mind, that at pick 15, the Indianapolis Colts is a prime landing spot for Brock Bowers. Fits the offense, would be great with... Um, Anthony Richardson, great with the rest of their offense, suits Michael Pittman really well to have that alternate option as the genuine number two. And then Josh Downs is your number three in the Colts offense. All right, I think Shane Steichen would really like that. I think he would certainly enjoy having a tight end of that caliber in the Colts offense. Great offensive mind. Why not give him more weapons to work with? So you do have to keep that in mind that if you're going to trade back beyond pick 15, you're going to miss out on the tight end that maybe you wanted to get. Now, at pick 15, you still have Amarius Mims on the board here. But what you've done is traded back twice to the point where you've added two more picks in the top 80, one of which is the 44th overall pick. And then I think you can take offensive linemen. Now, I like Morgan Moses. I think he can do a decent job. You know, he's a veteran. He's been around the league for a long time. But why not draft somebody like Amarius Mims here who's going to give you a guy who could rotate in at left tackle if you need to, or could end up being your starting right tackle by the time you come out of camp. So that's what we're going to do with the first round pick. You trade back twice. What's going on here? Updating players. What do you mean? What do you mean? Did I just lose everything that I did? Are we kidding? In the middle of a video? PFF, come on, I pay for this service. No way. Right. Okay, I guess we'll be coming back. All right, we're back. Now, that was that flew me, threw me completely out of whack. That was a nightmare. But things might look slightly different because we had to redo the entire draft, which is a nightmare. But we took Amarius Mims at pick number 18. Now, that was where we got to when I left you and PFF decided that they were going to rebuild their website in the middle of my video. I can't believe it, to be honest. But... We moved on. We took Amarius Mims in the first round. And I know, like I was saying, it's not the most glamorous pick. But at the same time, I do think that it's important to have that security with the offensive line. So I don't have a problem with that whatsoever. And then I think we can look at guys like linebackers, wide receivers, cornerback depth and stuff in the mid rounds, especially having accumulated the picks that we did at 44, 72, 80, all the stuff that we've... No, 72 is as already. 80 and 44. But we move on. Um, so the first round might look a little different than it was, but it is what it is. And now we are on the board again with the original third round pick. No, second round pick at uh, pick 44. All right. I'm all out of whack because we lost our communications with PFF mid recording. Anyway, pick number 44. So we take the offensive lineman in the first round, right? We're going to get back into the swing of it now. Now this gives us a really, really good option to take that third wide receiver um, the slot wide receiver with the 44th pick. Now, because we didn't take Brock Bowers, the tight end is off the board. Now, you probably have, is uh, Jatavion Sanders still here? He is. So you could look at the pass catching tight end if you wanted to. Jatavion Sanders is going to be a very close number two to Brock Bowers, I feel, in the NFL. The gap between them, in my mind, is not 15th overall pick to like 60th overall pick. They are closer together than that, in my opinion, uh, at the next level. But that being said, the wide receiver talent, if you don't get the tight end, you can get the third wide receiver. And there is not a better position to be in than the middle of the second round while looking for a slot wide receiver. So right now you have Roman Wilson, Ricky Pearsall, Jalen Polk, Jalen McMillan, um, couple of other guys on here, Malachi Corley, that could easily play that role. Then you're down to like Jacob Cowing and stuff a lot later on. Uh, for me, taking either Roman Wilson or Ricky Pearsall is a very solid option here. Now, my issue with Roman Wilson is the health, um, whereas Ricky Pearsall largely has a really clean slate and had a really good breakout year in 2023. Um, I think Ricky Pearsall is a really good option here for the Jets. Um, in terms of the hands, the route running, he was dicing guys up at the Senior Bowl. Um, didn't get a chance really to showcase just how talented he is in the years he spent at Florida. The pass game for the Gators didn't really have um, what he needed to be able to be like a 1,200-yard receiver. Um, they ran kind of multiple running backs. They didn't necessarily have elite-level talent in terms of the quarterback. They've been going through like this rebuild um, 
And Ricky Pierce will kind of got caught in the middle of that. So I do think that he's coming into this a little underrated. Now, I will just take a look at some of the other stuff that we have available in these rounds, like Peyton Wilson, for example. Um, if you're looking for a long-term replacement for CJ Mosley and a guy that could learn behind him and play in rotation in that linebacker three, uh, Peyton Wilson is absolutely that in terms of the speed, the nose for the football. We picked him in the Pittsburgh Steelers draft that we did last week um, in the second round because this is a difference maker. At linebacker, another guy who has climbed up draft boards in the past couple of months, tested really well, good speed, great agility, good downhill tackling linebacker, like in the traditional sense of a middle linebacker in the NFL. So Peyton Wilson absolutely um, has the ability to be uh, a second round pick and somebody the Jets could have their eye on. Then you've got uh, Mike Samer still from Michigan. Good corner, good coverage corner, good perimeter corner, um, good experience. Captain for Michigan could be a really good piece uh, for the Jets here in round two. You've got good defensive line depth in guys like Braden Fisk. He's another one who shot up boards in the last couple of months. Uh, Michael Penix is still here. Obviously, we had the Raiders taking him in the first round, but can't control that. Um you do have depth at safety as well. Like Tyler Newbin is still on boards here. Now I've had people sort of say to me that they feel like Tyler Newbin is a little overrated. So he's a guy that has jumped into the first round a couple of times and then kind of jumped back out of the first round. Now people are sort of saying that they feel like he's a little overrated. So let's keep that in mind. And then you've got Javon Bullard as well. It's not the best draft for like safeties. And um, I would imagine that we haven't seen one come off the board yet with the guys that are still available here. Cam Kinchin started off as a first round pick. He's kind of dropped out a little bit as well. Um, so I don't love the safety as much as I love the production that I know I could get from one of these wide receivers. So I'm going to go Ricky Pearson with the 44th pick. That takes us to pick 72, how are we doing for time, in uh, round three. And now we have two picks within the next 10. So we've got the 72 and we've got pick 80. Now, are there Jets fans out there that would like to see you guys draft Spencer Rattler here? Because honestly... You know, why not take Spencer Rattler, sit him behind Aaron Rodgers? At this point, Rodgers can't really be offended by it because he knows that he's got a couple of years left to go. Um, I don't hate that. And I think of the quarterbacks that are going to be available in the mid rounds, the most polarizing, most interesting of them, the most upside among them is Spencer Rattler from South Carolina. Had a very turbulent college career, but when he was on his game, like there's a lot that he can do. And he certainly has all the tools. A lot of his errors are mental mistakes. Um, if he has a bad game, it kind of gets away from him and things along along those lines. So he's one to watch. Um, also seeing Jalen Wright here is fascinating to me because I immediately think um, like what the Lions did with David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs. And I've made that comparison with Jalen Wright multiple times, but Jalen Wright is a SEC running back for starters who has experience running between the tackles with which Jameer Gibbs didn't necessarily have. But Wright also has the straight line speed, the agility to break through the second, the second secondary and just take off. Like you're not going to catch him. He's the fastest running back in the draft. There is a ton to like about Jalen Wright doing that, but it would mean taking some snaps away from Brees Hall. But maybe the Jets are interested in that. And if Jalen Wright's available here at pick 72 and you've got another pick coming up at pick number 80, you know, you're thinking about this offense with Brees Hall, Mike Williams, Garrett Wilson, Ricky Pearsall that we just drafted. And then you add another like, like speedy running back in Jalen Wright to be able to break away from the pack and pull away um, and have those kind of huge gains. It's looking more and more dangerous. And you've just built like this much improved offensive line as well. So like maybe Jalen Wright is the play here at pick 72. Um, let's look at some of the other positions of need that we had, like corner is one of them. The secondary is definitely something where I'd be looking to add a little bit of depth. Um, one of these guys in this region here is definitely a potential for that. Um, I think maybe we could go Max Melton. It would be good actually to see if we could get Jalen Wright and Max Melton with these two picks. Um, I don't hate Renardo Green or Jarian Jones from Florida State. Chris Abrams drain is another one that I like, and I've always liked Cam Hart. I do think Cam Hart's going to be good at the next level. Um, edge rush, do we need any additional depth there? There's nothing here really that's good value for me. Um, quite the drop-off after Gabriel Murphy, although I do like Xavier Thomas as a late-round value. Um, offensive line, Christian Mahogany, Cedric Van Pran, not a terrible call to go offensive line there. Um, don't need, we're not going to double dip on wide receiver. 
maybe safety Cam Kitchens is still here as well. So Cam Kitchens is not a bad option. So I actually think, right, we're going to take Jalen Wright here. Jonathan Brooks was still on the board. Was Jonathan Brooks still on the board? Was he really? He was. Wow. Okay. Um, that's an interesting topic of conversation, actually, because Jonathan Brooks obviously had the injury. Um, a lot of people had him as a second round pick and the first running back off the board. I didn't see that he was on the board there. Somehow I missed it. But at the same time, I do think there's a lot of people that would have Jalen Wright as the number one running back in this year's class. And that doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to come out and be Saquon Barkley or Zeke Elliott in year one. But at the same time, for a third round pick, I don't know that they are that far apart. Very different players, but and you couldn't draft Jonathan Brooks as the two to Brees Hall. Like, that doesn't work. Jalen Wright does. So that still works to me, even though Jonathan Brooks was on the board and I didn't see it. But at the same time, that's where we're at. And now at pick 80, Max Melton did go. So Max Melton is gone. So do we go for the safety and take Cam Kinchins and fill a need there in the secondary? Or do we look at corner? All right. So um, I apologize that it's getting dark now. I was recording this video in daylight and then obviously PFF kind of went down on me. So pause. Anyway, pick number 80, Andrew Phillips is the number one corner available. Now, I don't mind Renardo Green here. I really don't, but I would have him over Andrew Phillips. My issue with Andrew Phillips is like the, as, as a, like in terms of ball skills, I think he had zero interceptions the whole way through college. I think, um, great run defending corner, but I don't know that he's necessarily going to be worthy of a third round selection. I actually have him a little, a little lower down here. I've got guys like Chris Abrams drain a little higher up. Andrew Phillips has risen up boards because of how athletic he is. He's got a really great athletic talent. Don't know that I love it here in the third round. So I'm actually going to dodge that completely. I am looking at the safeties. I think I'm going to go Cam Kinjins with future starting potential here in the third round. Um, we'll probably see some rotational snaps and definitely special teams and things um, sort of coming out of the gate. And then maybe by the end of his sort of rookie season, he'll be in the starting rotation. But it was impossible to come out of this year's draft for the Jets without some additional talent in the secondary. So we'll take Cam Kinchins there and then we'll probably still look to be adding a corner. And what do we have at 111? Is Abrams Drain still there? No, but Cam Hart is. I'm going to go Cam Hart without even thinking too much about it in round four. Like if you're looking for mid round value, like if we fly through the first round here, Josh Newton is one. I do like Josh Newton. Um, other guys here that are good value in the fourth round. Uh, Matt Consalves, offensive tackle from Pitt. Definitely one of those guys. Uh, Cooper B, but guard is another one. But in terms of the guys that you're going to get the most from in like round four of the 2024 draft, I think Cam Hart is number one on that list. And he went off the board after Chris Abrams drain. I would have him above him. Um, and I, I just, I really like the guy. I like the size. Um, I like the frame. I like the ability to play on the outside. I like the man coverage. Um, so I would go there in round four. And that puts us on the board again at pick 134. Now, Xavier Thomas is still there. And he is a guy that I have definitely enjoyed um, getting to know a little bit during this process. But... What do we have that we could kind of go for? Christian Boyd is one there. Makai Wingo. Uh, so, okay, a little bit of a run of D linemen um, with Mason Smith from LSU as well. Uh, Marcus Rosemi, Jack Saint at wide receiver. You've got Theo Johnson at tight end. So Theo Johnson was one of the better tight ends at the Senior Bowl. Penn State might not have necessarily got as many target opportunities as he would have liked in college, but... He was the one that sort of stood out from the crowd. So if you're going to go tight end, is now the position to take one before you have like, I think it's 50, yeah, 51 picks before your next selection. So, or is there something that we need more? Like if we've just taken a corner and we've already addressed some of the offensive line and added some depth and we took a running back to be like, we didn't take a running back to be a backup running back, right? We took Jalen Wright to be a running back that comes in in that Jameer Gibbs role only for the Jets, obviously. Um, maybe linebacker, nah, nothing there. JD Bertrand, Steel Chambers, no, these, no. And then we're getting into like special teamers. So um, I'm going to take Theo Johnson. Yeah, I'll take Theo Johnson out of Penn State, do it all tight end, good, good value, really good value. Um, and then we have three picks left in the late round. So I'm going to go and finish these off and then we'll do an overall draft summary right at the end. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate it's a long video, but I love to really kind of get into the depth of it. Um, so let's go and talk about it. 
Uh, and then I will come back and do the summary at the end. Please do subscribe because, you know, this content is firing out between now and the draft. And uh, I'll see you in just a moment. Okay, so we are finished. That is it. The draft is done. We traded back twice in the first round and got Amarius Mims with the 18th overall pick. Then we go Ricky Pearsall in round two, Jalen Wright in round three, two playmakers on offense to complete the build uh, with the offense. Look, we've got three pieces there in the first three rounds that are all adding to Aaron Rodgers' arsenal to help him continue to be... Um, one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL and hopefully for Jets fans winning a Super Bowl. Then we kind of flipped to the defense for a couple of rounds. We took Cam Kinchins at safety in round three, Cam Hart in round four. Um, I have Cam Hart as like an A plus grade pick for the fourth round. So the C minus actually really upsets me. Um, then Theo Johnson in the fourth round was the last pick that you saw before I left you. So then I get Javian Cohen, a six foot four guard from Miami to play on the interior in round six. Um, high football IQ talent. Um, good blocker, not a great blocker, obviously, in the sixth round. We're getting a guy. There were two Hurricanes in this year's draft, actually. Didn't realize that, but add some depth on the offensive line and a guy that could play either guard position and rotate in if you need him to. Um, better in the run game, not necessarily the best in the pass game, but we will see kind of how he develops, but definitely has the size to play guard in the NFL. I just worry a little bit about arm length. Um, then you've got Keaton Oladapo in round seven from Oregon State, who is a safety that is available if he's available in round six, even round seven, then he's somebody I would be taking a flyer on. Um, really, really versatile safety that can be that down in the box, kind of downhill. Think about like a, uh, like a Buddha Baker type, uh, obviously not necessarily at that talent level. Let's not get overexcited, but at the same time, um, has a ton of potential at the next level. And then I took Eugene Asante out of Auburn um, because I think he's got a lot of potential, but I do have a feeling that he's going back to school. And I just realized that as I was recording the end of this video, I think he's going back to Auburn. So if you're any Auburn fans that are also Jets fans for whatever reason, um, let me know in the comments what you know about that. Um, but that is going to be the draft. And I think overall we've addressed the gaps in the offense that I felt like we needed going into the draft. I sort of said about the gap at wide receiver in the slot. Um, I mentioned having a lack of depth on the offensive line and some potentially a young tackle that could rotate in on either on either side for the two veterans that you've got as your cornerstones at right and left tackle. I thought that was important. Uh, the running back pick is kind of a luxury. Um, you could have you could have gone corner there. Yeah, I totally agree with that. But we sort of went through that process and talked it out as to why we didn't do that. Um, then Cam Kinchins, good safety depth. We needed that. Cam Hart, corner depth. We needed that. Uh, a tight end that could maybe break into the rotation as the number one tight end on the offense. Like Theo Johnson could win a role in that team. Uh, and then more depth with the later rounds. So you've got a drop off after the fourth round, of course. Then... Round six, Javion Cohen, uh, Keaton Oladapo, Eugene Asante, or someone of similar quality uh, that could be like a special teamer and also a rotational defender if they can play up to that standard. So, Jets fans, that will wrap the video. Um, I apologize that it's dark. Like, there's nothing worse than recording uh, a video. And I have good lighting in here, but also way too dark in terms of natural light at this point in the video. But it is what it is. That's PFS fault, not mine, right? No accountability for that on my end. Anyway... I appreciate you being here. If you made it all the way to the end of the video, please do subscribe to the channel. We will be doing more of this content and analyzing every single draft after the draft as to how they impact the team, um, whether they took play and positions of need, players of need, best player available, all of that stuff, um, and what to expect from those rookie draft classes going into the season. So if you want your fix uh, and you need that information going into the year, I will do my very best to break it all down for you. I appreciate you being here. Jets fans, let me know how you're feeling uh, and I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you so much for watching.